Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Tata Steel Chess 2024. It's the first major chess event of the year. This is round number nine out of 13. And oh my goodness, the good games keep on rolling in. We don't have the top three players in the world participating by rating, and yet we are still getting haymakers. Players are swinging for the fences. World champions are winning. They're losing. A bunch of players are basically drawing zero of their games. And in today's video, I'm going to take you through some more epic battles, some absolutely heartbreaking, gut-wrenching moments, some amazing victories and painful defeats. Here we go. We will kick things off with the Indian sensation, Pragnananda Ramesh Babu, who is now officially undefeated in over 40 classical games of chess. He has not lost a game in 40 games. We have an early stages of a giga streak forming. Of course, the records are held by guys like Magnus and uh, Dingley Ren, who have uh, gone on streaks of over 100 games without losing. Prague plays e4. He's up against Ju Wenchun, who has had a great event, uh, the women's world champion, playing up to a very high level. And Prague gets us going real early as my man plays the fried liver attack. Technically, this is not called the fried liver. The fried liver is uh, d5, ed, knight d5, knight f7. But for all intents and purposes, my man Prague goes for knight g5. Now, here, a massive disappointment as Ju Wenchun plays d5 instead of playing the Traxler. Can you imagine if she pulled up the Tata Steel and played a Traxler? Good Lord. I mean, seriously, that would have been absolutely incredible. Instead, she plays d5, e takes d5, and now not knight takes, but instead knight to a5, which is the main line. Prog gives a check, which is the main line. Black loses a pawn. All of this has been played tens of thousands of times before. And now bishop to d3. Another move is bishop to e2. Another move is queen f3. Prog chooses this, and Ju and Jun Plays knight to d5, setting up an attack on the knight with her queen, as well as looking at knight f4 possibilities. Prague plays h4, defending the knight. Ju and Jun plays queen c7. All right. So, there's a lot of lines here. Uh, h4 obviously defends the knight, and if black were to play h6, uh, I would imagine white would play queen h5, threatening checkmate. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, maybe, maybe he had something else planned, like maybe bringing this knight back or something, because actually after queen h5, queen f6... Uh, there, there, there is, I don't know, there, there, there's some very critical crazy lines here. But okay, queen c7. Now, computer actually gives bishop h7 as a free pawn. Uh, but Prague spends a little time and plays b3. So clearly still in his preparation. Low depth stockfish says, go take that pawn. Um, that looks absolutely deranged to me. But apparently it's the best move. Bishop e7. There is queen f3 threatening this. So I don't know. Prague goes here. Anyway, main line of fried liver is absolutely insane. Knight e4, and finally the knight goes back to c3, and we are in a situation where Prague is out of his preparation. I think here maybe bishop e7 is the only thing in Prague's notes. Plays f5. Ju and Jun plays f5, and now queen h5 check would run into this move king d8. Instead of a queen trade, because white is up a pawn, so white would enjoy trading some pieces. But instead we have knight c3, and basically a completely insane position where um, Prague is uh, up a pawn, but his position looks completely absurd. He's got all these pieces blocking his pawns. Black has a very, very strong pawn advantage in the center. And as you can tell from the evaluation, the position is dynamically balanced. So Prague plays knight a3 looking for knight c4. e4 played. Benji. I have a dog sitting in the room. I promise I'm not talking to, to, to nobody. And dog owners, you will know, your dogs will randomly chew themselves really loudly. So I promise I'm not going insane. So e4, attacks the bishop. Queen e2, pins the pawn to the king, as well as setting up pawn to f3 and long castle. Castles, bishop a6, she goes to e6. And now Prague is able to get a couple of pieces into the game. Let's not forget Prague is a pawn up. If Prague is able to simplify these pieces correctly, then he is going to be in good shape. Knight goes back to b7, and now a sophisticated move from Prague, who takes on b7, getting rid of one of black's pieces, and now pawn to a, uh, f3 first. Pawn to a3 was good, pawn to f3 uh, is good as well. He plays a3 a little bit later, but once he starts challenging the integrity of black's position, it's just going to be felt. Like, the pawn advantage is going to be felt. Knight to e5, rook to e1, adding more pressure, and now he turns his eye... To the G file. And as you can see here, there is a long term brewing attack. She gives away a pawn, he takes it, but it's just not good enough. There is not enough play to be had on that side of the board. He starts pushing out her pieces, and uh, the attack is roaring forward. Ju and Jun does grab a pawn back, 
but now a well-timed queen e5. And let me tell you, Prague is attacking very, very aggressively. Look at his pieces, and suddenly the white position comes alive. I mean, you look at you look at the position that he had, where everything was stuck. Black had good center control, but he slowly unwinds by trading off some of Black's major pieces, and then he turns his attention to attacking his opponent. Rook e1, Juwen Jun plays queen d7, Prague knight d6, Juwen Jun rook e7, queen h2, and now just simply queen h6. The queen is uh, unable to be captured. Queen d6. Bishop f6, that threatens rook g7 mate in a few moves, that threatens the rook, Juwen Jun resigns, Pragnananda wins, an absolutely beautiful game, he is now in first place. He just beat the women's world champ, a couple of rounds ago he beat the current world champion, that is Dingley Ren, he's also beaten Magnus Carlsen, this man is the champion of champions right now. He is looking to be in impeccable form, he has not lost a classical chess game in 42 games. Now, Hans Niemann, alright? In the challenger section, looking for a bounce back victory, plays a C5 Nimso Indian. He's looking to play a Benoni. That is literally what he is trying to do. He's trying to get his opponent to go here, at which point he would have played a Benoni defense, and we would have gotten a very imbalanced position. But instead of that, Haruka plays Knight F3. So she invites a capture in the center, and now we are in a sideline of the Nimso Indian. It's a very interesting uh it's not really a nimso indian it's kind of like a sideline of an indian defense just period no pun intended because haruka's indian but it's it's what it's called if you look at the database and hans plays knight c6 she brings the knight back plays a3 and now hans starts instigating on the queen side with this move b5 and here there's a moment of hesitation uh from haruka who plays b3 bishop b2 and now hans is able to push this pawn and annoy the position a little bit. Haruka plays a4. But that move locks the queen side and basically makes it very difficult for white to do something in the future. Admittedly, taking is also not a very pleasant looking move. It allows black to get an active knight, but not having all of this lockdown here would give white chances in the future. She decides to lock the position instead of playing that. Hans goes here, and now they get into a maneuvering game. So Hans puts his knight on a5 where, yeah, I mean, it's going to pressure the position for a very long time. And then he trades the bishop because that's white's better bishop, right? This is a bad bishop. The better bishop gets traded. Haruka continues to maneuver. Hans comes back and he's just going to try to seize control of the dark squares. e5. Sabotaging his control of that square. Haruka could now potentially maneuver, but it's very difficult. She goes here. The idea is to go knight c2. Hans plays knight d8, because he's also got ideas of his own. He's, he's going to put the knight on c5 and pressure all of this. And Hans wins the race. The thing is, Hans is going to win the race of annoying his opponent. He's got all the right situation here. Look at White's bishop. This is a really difficult position. The only thing that's making this position still maintainable for White is the fact that there's no easy way to break through. So Hans starts taking more space. I mean, he's trying to take as much away from White as possible. Right? Knight d5. Now he takes with the knight. He takes with the knight because white's options are to go here, opening the c-file and the diagonal, which loses, or this, which gives Hans the dominance to play with his f and e pawns. Right, Haruka could have just sort of stayed put. Probably what she should have done is gone h4, tried to lock it down and just basically say, my position's not great, but you can't beat me. Then I'll put my bishop on h3 and I'm going to be all right. But instead she makes a very committal decision and Hans trades plays bishop c8, and just all his pieces come alive from a distance. He completely dominates the board, and he just does a great job here of hunting down the white position on all three sides. e4 is a major threat. The pawn arrives on h3, being sacrificed to open up the file. Araka doesn't even take it. And now Hans just, oh my god, everything, all of it. Just a, a little bit of hesitancy from Haruka, and just a, just a great game from Hans. Trades the queens, opens up the position, the rook gets in, dominance. Dominance from start to finish. Just a great game by him, all the pieces controlling, and he marches in, and, and, and white is completely defenseless. The knight can't move. If you move the knight, let's say to d1, I will take on g4 with check, and you will be promptly mated. So it's a very, 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 very nice game from Hans Niemann. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if it was a perfect one. Like, that was just a positional squeeze from the chess gods, is what that was. An absolutely stellar game by him, a bounce-back game for him, and he, he, he wins a very nice one. Oh, this is heartbreak. I'm about to show you a game that's going to make you cry. D4, D5, and my man, 
Max Varmadam, who played this a couple of rounds ago uh, against... Um, not a couple of rounds ago, literally last round against Gukesh. Do you remember that game? It was that, that game where it was a mirror image capture, Queen A4 was played, and then Gukesh was a, was a pawn up. And then Mac, uh, Max Varmadam played like 30 moves of prep. Well, Parham knew that that was going to happen, so he just plays his own line. And he plays it like this, Knight sees he can't take the Knight because of the pin. So they play a position, and now both guys are out of prep. Max has to think on his own. He plays a game... Excuse me. He plays a gambit with black where he's a pawn down after like four moves. He plays it back to back round, so the guys know he's gonna play it. Right? And yet, look at the position that he gets from the opening. Bishop c4. Making it very difficult for white to move. Both guys, as you can see from the time management, are playing on their own. Barham plays 94, long castles. And my friends, uh, Max Varmerdam is cooking. He is literally winning this game in about 12 moves. He's going to go knight t3. a3, knight t3, take, take. White will literally never castle. You'll play rook g8, put a queen on the c, you know, on the light squares, and you're just going to win the game. So, Parham Maksudlu now has to sacrifice material. He goes queen e4 and literally loses a rook. He has nothing better. He has to lose a rook. But the good news for him is that the knight is trapped. It cannot go to c2 because you'll play rook c1. So, Parham Maksudlu, despite all of this still ends up in a position, when it all's said and done, where he's worse. Black has a rook for a knight and a pawn. Black is winning. Max Varmadam just played his gambit for his goofy gambit, second game in a row, and he is just winning the game. Bishop f8. And now he's going to try to win this game by getting a pawn majority moving. If he can push those pawns, he's going to win the game. He's completely winning. Knight e4. And now, rook a2, knight f6. And here... He doesn't have to do this. Probably it's better to show a little self-control, but Max didn't want to lose this pawn. And then, you know, the other pawns are going to start rolling. So instead of doing all of that, he just says, I'm going to give this back. And then I'm going to go here. And I'm up a pawn, and I have connected passers. Now, Stockfish evaluates this as about equal, but you start moving forward. How is White going to stop Black's pawns? White has pawns of his own, but how is he going to stop the pawns? I got news for you. He's not. He's just straight up not going to stop them. Max is an absolute genius. Pushes the pieces all the way back. And rook h2 and a3. And, and Max is winning again. Just an absolutely breathtaking game from him. Playing this ridiculous gambit that is not supposed to work at top level. But it is working. Rook c7. Rook h3 check. Bishop f2. Rook f7. And now if he just plays b4, I think he's just completely winning. But he plays bishop c5. Rook c7. Pawn to a2. And that's it. The pawn is just going to make it. Pawn's just going to make it. Rook c8. Rook a8 check. Is coming. King a4. Parham just goes e6. It's the best that he can do. And in this position, you can't make a queen, because I will do this. But what you can do is play king b3. The point is, if rook a8, you play king b2, and the pawn just queens. You sack, you sack the bishop for the pawn, and you win. All right? Take, take, queen. Or rook a3 even which cuts off the, the king. So king b3 is probably winning. The best line there is rook c5, queen, you try to queen, and then I can probably stop you by playing queen a8. Instead of that, in this position, Max Varmerdam plays rook a3, which actually messes up his advantage, because after take a1 queen e7, the pawn is queening. There's no way to stop it. By some sort of miracle, if you play queen e1 check, I go here, you have no more checks. Rook e3, take, take, rook e5. White wins because there's no way to stop the pawn. So this is completely nuts. a1, e7, and Max Varmadam is no longer winning the game. Oh my goodness. He plays a move here. He, he has a lot of moves. A lot of these moves are given an equal evaluation, but this is a very stressful position. He plays queen h8, and he loses. He loses to the absolutely incredible rook c8. Rook c8! Oh my goodness, you can't take because it's a fork! So queen h7, the king go the pawn goes up the board, there are no more checks, and white is queening! And the worst part is if rook a1 to go rook e1, I, I just check you and I win your rook and then I queen. I can also just block with the knight, I mean it is absolutely heartbreaking. Parham Maksudlu fights to the bitter end and he wins a game temporarily down a queen. 
And in this position, Max Varmerdam just resigns because not only is he now down a knight, he's also going to get mated soon. You can't go check because the king goes here. The king is safe. Unreal. I mean, this is so crazy. He plays this gambit twice. He's 0 out of 2. He should have been 1 and a half out of 2. At the very least, he should have been 1 out of 2 with 2 draws. I mean, this is so heartbreaking. What an absolutely insane game. Max Varmerdam goes down. Parham Maksudlu gets a much-needed victory. Now, another game. Alexander Donchenko from Germany. Ali Reza Firuja. This one is just a Queen's Gambit decline. There are no goofy gambits. Ali Reza does play Bishop B4, which is a bit of an aggressive line. Generally, you play C6 and the Bishop goes to these two squares. But in this game, Ali Reza plays a very aggressive Queen's Gambit decline. My boy came to win. Knight e4, he grabs the bishop and he has the bishop pair. Brings his bishops back to their home base. And this is the position that we have in the opening. Ali Reza, look at this, g4. Shoving the queen backwards, but potentially creating long-term weaknesses. And now, Alexander Donchenko plays some inspired chess. He could castle, but he's not really ready for that yet. I think he doesn't like that black can play h5 and lock down the position. So my man just shoves his own goofy rook on the h5 square and says, Ali Reza, you can't connect your pawns. And like a good wrestler, Ali Reza's trying to connect his hands. He's trying to connect his pawns to throw the opponent, not physically. So it actually would be a good fight. I think Donchenko outweighs Firuja, but Firuja might be taller. Anyway, they can take chess boxing after this. Uh, rook h5, you don't, you don't let him connect the pawn so he can't, uh, he can't, you know, put pressure on your position. And now knight d7. Ah, oh, Donchenko is a principled man, all right? He knows that with the king in the center, he doesn't necessarily have to castle. He can open up the position. And now he is taking the fight to Firuja. And that is the way you have to play. Knight f6, e takes d5, sacrificing the rook that he put there completely. He put the rook there and he went there to die. The purpose... You want to take the bishop and open up your opponent's position. And it's too dangerous. Now he backs up. And it's actually very difficult for Feruja to move. But he moves the king manually to g7. Knight b5 looking to get the bishop. Feruja says, okay, you can have the bishop. I don't want to lose any time. I'm going to take the file. Now you can't castle, stupid. Knight d6, queen d6. King f1. All right, we are obviously not afraid of castling. Queen b6. We defend ourselves. Bishop d7. I'm manually walking my king to safety. Rook c8, queen f4, and now rook h4. So in this maneuvering game, Donchenko says, wait a minute, what about the pawn, right? Ali Reza could have played rook c8, but instead he goes for more, and suddenly Donchenko's just going to win his pawn. He tries to defend it from the other side, but rook h4. How do you defend the pawn? Rook c1. I've got ideas to go rook c5, rook c7, and my king is going to go behind my rook, and my king is somehow safe. How did that happen? And it goes from bad to worse because bishop d3... Rook c5, well-timed. Bishop takes g4. Donchenko's a pawn up, and it's a very, very valuable pawn. It's a pawn that Ali Reza did not have to do. He didn't have to do all of this. He played a little bit too aggressively. Too much of a bloodlust to win the game. He can't play like this in the candidates tournament. All right, I understand he's trying to win every game. He's trying to please the fans. He's trying to gain elo. But uh, he's just under a huge attack now. Now, in this position, bishop g6, and the game goes on. White will probably play g4, maybe rook c7. But instead of that, Ali Reza goes rook h6, and now it's bad to worse, because all the pawns are under fire. Rook h7, the pawn falls, you can't take it. You take it with the knight, it's queen f7, queen h7, you take it with the rook, I take. It's game over. The queen out of the game, the bishop just ceramic, the rook is nice, but it's not doing anything. And Alexander Donchenko hands Ali Reza Feruja another loss. This man Ali Reza is on a roller coaster in this event. Up and down, up and down, up and down. I mean, he wins a game. It's like breathtaking. He loses a game. It's crazy. Donchenko gets a win as well. And the best part is I have more games for you. There were decisive games in no less than three more battles. And even more than that. Wei Yi versus Yan Yipomnishi. This one, a bishop's opening. Uh, you'll notice that Wei Yi does not play uh, knight c3 too fast. So here comes d5. Yan trades the dark squared bishops. They both move their A-pawns for reasons I can't really explain to you because you're like 2,000 points higher, lower rated than them. And rookie one, rookie eight. It's just a very stable position. White will spend the game trying to attack these pawns as he reroutes and does exactly as I say. Also, he will put the knight there and try to take advantage of the fact that black has moved his pawns in a certain way so the knight cannot be easily removed. 
And there is another targeting of the pawn. He's trying to get a position where black will have this very ugly pawn. So Jan goes here. And as you can see from the time management, Wei Yi still very much in his prep. Could reroute, could reroute, could play c4 as well to try to break up the position. Bishop c6, there it is. Trying to open up the position. Bishop b5, a b5. Pressure here, open up the rook. Jan plays queen f4, creating counterplay. Wei Yi tries to kick the queen out, the queen still hangs around. He's opening up the center. It's a very, very critical moment here. Jan plays rook d8, and now Wei Yi opens up the position again. And Jan's center blockade is kind of falling apart. EF, queen f3, are we going to go to an endgame? Listen, if we go to an endgame, you count the pawns. White is, white is winning. That pawn survived. Computer here says that it's equal for black. It says this is not scary. Black will trade, probably trade again, and then win this pawn with something like knight e8. But instead of that, Jan tries to keep the queens on the board. But now Wei Yi plays knight c4, and this is really bad news. Because if Jan doesn't trade the queens, Wei Yi is the attacker, and he's got the full stomach. So Jan plays h5. This is vintage Jan Nepomnishi. He's just trying to create chaos. If Wei Yi can mitigate this chaos, he's going to win this game. He plays d6, opening up his light squared bishop. And now a beautiful move. A move that is very easy to miss in a position like this. King f8 was played to get out of the way of the bishop, to also prevent any rook from arriving on e7. Except that's exactly what Wei Yi does. It's called a collinear move in the words of Robert Hess. A move on the same line of sight as a piece that can take you. And the idea is quite simple. You would like to take with the pawn, force the king out, force the king back, and re-arrive. And now Jan is stuck. Nothing can move. Knight f7 is a massive threat. But this is vintage Jan Yiponmishi. Here comes queen d2. The counterplay is not finished. Apparently there was a better way to do this. It was to play queen e2, king f8, and then knight d6. So keep the queen here, prevent any counterplay, because the way it happens in the game, now Wei Yi has to trade the queens, and he has to try to win this endgame. Yan Yipomnishi sacrifices his a pawn. Bishop a2. He didn't want to take it. If you take the pawn on a4, there's various tricks maybe with the knight, and knight d5 and coming in here. But now we have a3. Wei Yi starts bringing his king, and uh, there is no way for Yan Yipomnishi to create counterplay. This is an umbrella pawn. You are hiding behind the pawn. The bishop is pressuring f7. Jan tries his best to create counterplay, but he is completely paralyzed. Not a single one of his knights or his rook can get anywhere. Wei Yi shuts down Jan Yipomnishi, absolutely brutalizes his position, and Nepo resigns. This is Nepo's first defeat in the event, I think. Which is crazy. Wei Yi wins a much-needed game as well. Yet another decisive result. Now, Jordan Van Forest, Nodjebek, Abdusatorov, Nodjebek was just absolutely dismantled by Jan Nepomnishi. So all the players are taking points off of one another. e4, e5. Knight f3, knight c6. This time we do not get knight g5. We have this. And Jordan plays in a very forcing way with d5. We actually saw... You remember the game Marc-Andrea Marizzi versus Hans Niemann? No. Yes. Yes, Marc-Andrea Marizzi versus Hans Niemann. Uh, Hans. Hans Niemann. Uh, Bishop b3. And now knight h4, looking for queen to h5 check. By a miracle, Jordan doesn't blunder it. And now Nodjerbek is just trying to open up the center of the board as much as possible. He's basically punishing Jordan. He's like, Jordan, this is not how you play chess. What are you doing? Like, why are all your pieces in the center of the board? You're going to play this provi- Oh. Oh, no, I pinched something in my back. Oh, my God. Ah. Chess is a brutal game. Queen e7, bishop 2 e3. He's like, you're going to keep your king in the center. I'm going to open it up. Let's go. Knight f3. Now Nodjebek wrote Jordan Van Forest an Instagram DM and said, I'm going to oil up your position. Knight to e4. I have knight d6 coming. I have bishop b6 coming. Jordan finally gets castled, but knight to d2, an excellent blockade, and the attack there is roaring forward. And uh, the position's very balanced here. Uh, balanced is, uh, you know, it's, it's it, rather, it's, it's imbalanced. Uh, but it's still kind of, you know, it's within reasonable terms of each player. Uh, and then Jordan goes here, which, uh, I guess he was trying to play knight f6, but that move takes the eye off d5, so Nodjebek responds. Now knight c5, queen e2, trying to put the queen on b5 potentially, and also defending key squares in the position. And Jordan goes here. And Nodjebek brings his rook. And Jordan goes here, and Nodjebek takes the bishop, and does this, and threatens that, and that, and also b4, and, and Jordan resigns.
What? Yeah, according to the database, Jordan just resigned here. That... Wow. I mean... Without this... I mean, I, is this accurate? Because, uh... I guess he just hated his position so much, I don't... What could have possibly happened? Queen d2, why not knight b3? I mean, I, I, I guess he was trying to... I don't know. Maybe he just really thought his position was just completely lost? I have, I have no idea. Uh, in fact... I'm gonna go look it up. Yeah. I mean, I guess the position was just totally hopeless. And I have one more game for you. Marc-Andrea Marizzi, this man is absolutely brutalizing the challenger section. It is a ready. He's playing against Divya Deshmukh, who's having a very good event. And he plays in a very symmetrical way. It's a completely symmetrical position. Completely symmetrical. So white tries to take advantage. Because if you take me, I'm going to open up pressure on this. I'm going to get a good position. Divya plays e6. Take, take. And Mark andre says, let's play this position. You will also notice uh, he's spending a lot of time. Like, I mean, he's, you know, he's trying to play rook c1, knight a4. Kind of calm down the initiative that Divya will try to create. Bishop a6. There's knight a4. Knight d7. And now it's going to be a slow, methodical movement of these pieces. Queen goes up to fight for the dark squares. Bishop b5 trying to take the knight and ruins white, ruin white structure. So, knight c3. Divya says, take my bishop. Go ahead. Because if you do, I'm going to undouble my pawn. Or not. She didn't want to undouble her pawns. Okay, I guess she's holding out to play c5. That makes a lot of sense. a5. Okay, she plays a5. And a4. It all makes a lot of sense. Queen goes back to b7. All right, we have a big, big dance there. Now, she's not going to get to play c5 now, but her position's still pretty, pretty okay. Queen d7. I'm worried about that C-pawn, though, because she never actually got rid of it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no, it's a massive weakness. Oh, no. Okay, Rook A3 is taken. And, I mean, the C-pawn is just, is still just standing there. And now she has to give up the knight because the pawn is too strong. Marc-Andre Marc -Andre could have played this. He didn't because of c5. So he went bishop e1. And I mean, yeah, the pawn falls. And that c-pawn just is a weakness the whole game. He brings his king all the way to the queen side. That c-pawn is still a massive liability. And he plays king c5. And at the end, she defends it. He plays king d6 to go here. and Or there, by the way. And Divya resigns because, yeah... Black is completely toast. You can play bishop b6, a b, king b6. I will give you check, very important. Put the king back on the a file, and then I will go feast on your pawns. I mean, this pawn is like literally ruining black's position. c5, I can go here, remove the defense. So the fact that Divya just did not get rid of the c pawn, and Marc Andrea played the whole game against this backwards pawn. A backwards pawn is a pawn that is standing behind another pawn, has no pawns to support it. Right? And can't move forward because white because the other side controls the square in front of it. So it, it's supporting a pawn, but it can't move forward itself. It can't actually progress in its own life. And in this game, it was the thorn in the black position the entire game. Literally the entire game. And Marc Andre wins. I got news for you. Marc Andre is destroying the challenge. He is up a full point. But you know who's not destroying any section? These guys. Nordirbeck, Anish, Prag, Gukesh, five and a half. Then you got Vidit, Alireza, Weiyi. You got seven people half a point apart from each other, and there's four rounds to go. <clears throat> and Prague is also cooking. Gukesh is cooking. Everybody's cooking. Alireza's cooking and blowing up the kitchen every other game. I don't know what to say, but uh, I'll see you all for round number 10. Now get out of here.